Welcome to the Dublin Bible Talks, midweek Bible talks for workers in Dublin. I'm Cameron Jones. In our second talk from Ephesians 4, 17 to 5 verse 3, we find that we should not just walk the walk, behave differently as Christians, we should talk the talk. Use our speech differently to the world, especially in our words to other Christians, because of the impression Jesus makes on us. And please consider joining us live on Wednesdays from your workplace, 1pm Dublin time on Zoom. It's a simple way of identifying as a Christian in your workplace. Simply use the link bit.ly slash Dublin Bible Talks. That's bit.ly slash Dublin Bible Talks. Well, friends, this is the second half of the talk that I started last week, Ephesians 4, 17 to 5 verse 3. Um, the theme really is you, you, that Christian people must live lives altered by the passion and identity of that is ours in Jesus. And the outcome should be that we will go out and live our lives completely for God without any compromise. So started last week with the question, what is the place of holy living in the Christian life? If we're saved by grace, why do we involve ourselves with good works? And I was uh, relating to you how someone in this call has said to me, oh, I get it now. We don't do good works to get right with God. We now do everything for his glory. And that's a better summary than I could ever have come up with. We, verse 17, verse to 24, looked at, that's what we looked at last week. We were looking at how we walk the walk. We live out a life which is different as Christian people. And verses 17 to 19, we're saying how we don't walk, not like the Gentiles. We don't live in any way like the way we used to, not like the way the world does. And we looked at the list that he gives of the way the world thinks and acts. Futile thinking, darkened understanding, verses 17 and 18. Separated from God, ignorant, with hardened hearts like Pharaoh from Egypt in the Old Testament, insensitive, calloused, and at the same time doing anything they could to make themselves feel something, giving themselves over to sensuality, verse 19, full of lust and impurity and indulgence. That's what the world's like. That's what we were, but now, well, the way of Christ, verses 20 to 24. You didn't come to know Christ that way. We've heard differently. And we learned that we did not learn Christ this way. And we noticed that the way he says it is that it's not just about learning a way of behaving. It's about Jesus himself being the message. Christianity is not about the teachings of Jesus, but about Jesus himself, who has the authority to teach. Jesus doesn't deliver the message. He is the message. And we heard that and we were taught that. We received it by hearing it. In verse 21, the according to the truth in Jesus. So there are the kinds of things that we were starting to look at. And as a result of being taught Jesus, we have our minds being made new. And we saw the parallel with what Paul says in Romans chapter 12, that God's purpose for us in Christ is to renew us. We are not to conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And so all of that we could sum up, sum up in saying we are to walk the walk, not the walk of the old life, not walk in the way of the Gentiles who do not know God, but instead putting on like a new set of clothes, the life of Christ with right relationship and right behaviour. Now we move on to verses 25 through to 32 and then into five verse, uh, shall we go to three? Yeah, that's right. Now, there is a movement around that suggests that maybe we need to relearn the old proverb. That proverb that says, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Insisting on the right to free speech, including the right to offend other people. Insisting that there is a different category between hurting with physical blows and words that hurt feelings. But Christian thinking knows that words 
are not only the are not really the issue, and neither actually are physical blows. What lies behind them are thoughts, and thoughts are something that God cares about. And whether the thoughts are expressed physically in doing physical damage to someone, or they're expressed with words so that they create hurt in people, God is interested in both of those misdoings. And so when we are changed by Jesus to be like him, what drives us is the truth. Not only truthful in our actions, but truthful in our words. And have a look at verse 25. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbour, for we are all members of one body. We are to put off falsehood and put on truth as Christian people. If Christ is the truth, then we know our lives in relationship with him must be characterised by truth. Christians speak truth to each other. We're honest with each other in a way that makes us distinctly different to the rest of the world. Why? Why will we be like this? What does it say there? It says, For we are all members of one body. One body. Our truthfulness is actually a direct application of our unity together. Lying to a member of our own body is to a lie is to lie to ourselves. Can you see the futility of doing that? Can you see how doing that would make no sense? Put off falsehood, put on truth. First of all, have a look at what he has to say about anger and sin, verses 26 and 27. If you're angry with another Christian person, what are you to do? Verse 26, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry, and don't give the devil a foothold. Quite literally, he writes, be angry and do not sin. All this section that we've been looking at is full of reality. Uh, it recognises that life together as Christians can be hard work. That's why back in chapter 4 verse 2 we were told to be patient. It's why we were told to bear with each other in love. And back then I said, I realise in my own special ways I can be deeply annoying. And so it's wonderful to be in a group of people who will be patient and will bear with people like me. And I'm asked to bear with people like you. In what way will anger at another believer potentially lead you to sin? What kind of sin? Well, here the context is all about living in Christian unity. If we find ourselves angry at another believer, we are not to act towards them in such a way that will damage the unity that Christ has given us. Instead, Verse 3, we are to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace, back in 4 verse 3. There will be issues that will make us angry with other believers. And Paul says, be angry, but do not sin. And in doing that, he's actually quoting Psalm 4. In that psalm, the writer of the psalm, maybe David, is accused unjustly. And he feels the pain of this anger expressed against him in false accusation. But the psalmist's search at the words ends up being replaced by joy and peace that is found in God. And he, he calls his accusers who are angry at him. He turns to them and says, Do not sin, but instead ponder your words in your hearts as you lie on your bed and be silent. This is exactly what he says. He says, In your anger do not sin. When you are on your beds, search your, heart, search your hearts and be silent. It's very similar language to what we have here in Ephesians, isn't it? Paul says, In your anger do not sin and do not let the sun go down on your anger. The psalmist is telling his accusers as they lie on their beds, as they're dwelling on their anger at him, and the psalmist calls them from their false accusations against God's king to consider their hearts and withhold their words. And Paul tells the Ephesians and us much the same thing. 
At night, if we lie in bed and you're angry, search your heart and silence your angry words against members of the body of God's great King. Don't give the devil a foothold that would split the unity that is between believers. God has made a unity in us. Don't give the devil a place, an opportunity among God's people. This unity is so important that Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, even argues it would be better to accept being wronged and cheated than let the world see Christians being incompetent in keeping peace between each other. Well, that's hard teaching, isn't it? It means putting your own interests aside. But remember, this is not all about you, and it's also not about the person who's done wrong to you or is being ang- who's made you angry. It's all about Jesus. Look now at verse 28. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. Isn't this practical? Do you see how the things they're taught at the beginning in verse 22, they're being retaught here? And you might say, of course we don't steal. I might say back to you, well, how do you approach your tax return? Do you, uh, do you, des- do you approach that with a d- desire for generosity towards society or you, do you approach it with selfishness? What is driving your heart in those kinds of situations? But actually, that's not all that this sentence teaches us. Not only do not steal, notice we're also instructed about how we should work. We who take Jesus as Lord are to work, and we are to be hard working. Is that how you are known in your workplace? Because that is how Christians should be known in our workplaces. To be people who work hard, even when the boss isn't looking. We are to be doing something useful, we're told. With the other writings in the New Testament in mind, I don't think this is about the type of work you do, as if Christians are to choose a particular profession that is defined by a relative usefulness. Some people have thought, and unfortunately in the past, that uh, something being something like a Christian doctor is being more obedient than being, well, what shall we insert there? <laughs> A corporate accountant, (laughs) Uh, whatever example. No, it's not about that. No, it's about how you you can honour Jesus in your workplace by doing any number of things, by being hardworking, being of use to your employer. But what is the primary use of the income we receive? Have a look at the passage there and you'll notice that it doesn't say anything about making an extension to your house or providing private schooling to your children or your next holiday. It's not all about personal pleasure and comfort. Verse 28, that he may have something to share with those in need. Now, while certainly not exclusive, the vision here is within the community of believers. If there's someone in our church gatherings who is needy, the other Christians who are members of that community have a responsibility to do what we can to use our surplus income to help them. Of course, friends, in order to do this, we need to get over the very common hesitance we have to admit that we have a need. Um, Our unity in Christ, friends, is more important than our individual pride. So if you are needy, we need to let other Christians know we have a need so that they can serve us. But when we find out that there is another Christian who has a need, our hard work that leads to an income enables us to serve other people, particularly, and in a priority, other Christian people. But Paul returns to matters of talking the talk in verse 29. Notice how he returns to that topic from talking about work to then saying, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. 
What is meant by unwholesome talk? Unwholesome, the words associated with rottenness. Of course, it will mean that we will not use foul language like some of our colleagues might. But what Paul is speaking of here is best defined as the opposite of what he then says positively. Notice what he says, not unwholesome talk, but what's in its place? Only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, so that it may benefit those who listen. Notice the other person focus is still the case. Unwholesome talk, therefore, is what tears others down. And Christian people don't use our words like that. Instead, we use our words to build each other up. Just like we learned back in verse 11. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so the body of Christ might be built up. So everything we do, and everything we say, to each other, must be considered in terms of the work that God has prepared in advance for us to do, which is the work of building his people into maturity in Christ. Do you notice that there is an application, uh, an attention given to others to whom we're speaking? Look at it again. We are to build each other up according to their needs. Not according to what we would like to say to them, but according to their needs. Think about the people who come here to the Dublin Bible Talks. What do the others on this call need to hear from you that will help them become mature? How can you do that? Maybe in the WhatsApp group. Maybe that's the most effective tool we have for that. But what can you do to use your words to build the others in this group up in their knowledge and love of the Lord Jesus Christ? Notice again the centrality of words in the life of believers, in the work that God has for us. Verse 11 says we are taught as we gather. Verse 12, to prepare us for works of service. Verses 13 and 14, so that we may be built up and grown maturity. Verses 15 and verse 25, so that we can speak words of truth to each other. Verse 26, we hold our angry words back. And we don't speak anything rotten, but only what is going to be good for building the others up who we meet with. There's a summary of what we've looked at so far. The final section of this passage, uh, chapter 4, verse 30 to 5, verse 3, is about being impressed by God's Spirit, or another way of saying it, imitate God. The contrast to this behaviour of God Um, of uh, being impressed by God's Spirit, is grieving God's Spirit. Verse, Verse 30, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. We had a question about that phrase last week, didn't we? What does it mean to grieve the Holy Spirit of God? And this is where we find a bit of an answer to that question. Those in the congregation who first heard this letter And those in this call who might know the Old Testament well might remember a passage in Isaiah. It tells of the Lord who is the kind and compassionate one to his people. Towards a people, surely, due to his kindness, they would not be false to him who saved them, but they'd surely be true to him. But then the writer saw that in Israel's history, in um, Oh, yeah, they, they were in Egypt in their distress. They were saved by the blood of a lamb and God lifted them out of slavery and carried them away and he brought, he bought them, he redeemed them. But what did Israel, what did the people of Israel do having been rescued like that? Well, Isaiah 63 verse 10 says, They rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. And so he turned and became their enemy, and he himself thought, fought against them. That's the origin of Paul's language here. He's calling us to learn from Israel's history. Having been rescued, we are not to live or speak in a way that grieves the one who saved us. 
We were not set apart, we were not sealed in order to grieve him, but to glorify him. That helps us understand what it means to grieve the Holy Spirit. But what's this question of being sealed? Well, certainly the purpose of a seal is is to close a document in certain cases, to seal it, to make it more secure. That's certainly something that a seal does, but it's not all a seal does. I was once given a seal with wax as a gift, and as the wax is melted and dripped onto the paper and the seal is pressed into the wax, the wax conforms to the shape of the seal. The Spirit of God pressed into us conforms us to the pattern, to the shape, to the behaviour of God, not any other pattern. And a seal is also equivalent of a signature. When we are sealed by God's Spirit, it's God putting his mark on us and saying, this is my work. And so the list of things in verse 31 are things that do not fit the shape of God's seal that is on us. The list, verse 31, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. That is not the pattern of the seal. That is not the pattern of God's workmanship in us. But instead, verse 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, as in Christ God forgave you. Yes, we should imitate God in our relationship between each other. If we are forgiven by our Master, King and God, how can we justify treating others? each other any other way. Chapter 5, verse 1, Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice. Perhaps that illustration made more immediate sense in their world than it does in ours. In that age, a farmer's child would be trained and developed to be a farmer themselves, like father, like son. Jesus' apostles, James and John, they were the sons of Zebedee, and they worked with him in the family fishing business, like father, like son. The term son of God applied to Jesus communicates that he was about his father's business. And he went and then he went to the cross and he shows himself the true son of the father doing the Father's work, reconciling all things to himself. In the story of the prodigal son, uh, he was no longer worthy to be called a son because he had abandoned his father's instruction. He would not acted like a son should to a father. He had abandoned the family work. Friends, if we are God's dearly loved children, we are to follow him in his work in his character and in his actions. We are created by him for work that he's prepared in advance for us to do. And as his children, we will walk and work with the Father as he does his work. We are not to strike out on our own. We're not to act in a way that is not like the seal he has marked us with. And remember again, this is all centred around Jesus, the Christ who loved us and gave himself up for us. Jesus, you will notice, remains at the centre of all of this teaching. It is his fragrant offering to God of his life, blood. That's our constant focus of every aspect of our lives and every bit of our relationship with each other. Our lives are to be living signs of that act of Jesus, so that in us, as people see the way that we act toward each other, as we are his body... Jesus is clearly seen by others. Our priority in this group every week is not just to meet here on Wednesdays for our own benefit, but to be here to encourage each other to be Christians in our workplaces. Be here and remind each other that we prioritise God's work as we go about our weekly work for our employers. 
Have a look now at verse 3 of chapter 5. He says, But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, for these are improper for God's holy people. Notice how high a standard that is. Notice that the only place for sexual intimacy for Christians is between a relationship established by a public commitment of one man for one woman for life. That is God's definition of marriage. And we will, as Christians, insist on that standard among Christian communities. There's got not even going to be a hint of that among us, or of anything else that is impure, nothing greedy. Now, greed is important to note here. We may not be directly influenced by what is called prosperity theology, but we are influenced by the greed of our culture, I think. It's very hard not to be. Link that to the previous teaching of verse 28, earning so that we can be generous to others. Just consider again, what did you use your last bonus for? If you got a bonus or your last raise, what were you excited you might be able to do? Did you even consider the needs that might be held by the congregation of believers that you meet with? Who are your brothers and sisters? A part of the body of Christ. Now, don't misunderstand me. It's not Cameron here saying, uh, we're poor, you should give. And uh, it, No, no, don't understand in that way. No, this is, what are you doing with the, the income you get from your hard work that is glorifying Christ? Both the way you do your work, but also what you do with the income from your work. Is your behaviour with that centred around Christ and his body, the other Christians who you know and are growing in love for, who you are aiming to build up in their knowledge and love of the Lord Jesus. Well, friends, you can see from this section of Ephesians that good theology is very deeply practical. This is all written in the light of the God who planned to save us in Christ from before the beginning of time. It's all in the light of King Jesus who has risen and has ascended. And we are undeserving beneficiaries of God's great plan to bring all things under one head, even Christ. And in being saved, we are saved from a previous way of life for a new way of life characterized by obedience to him, saved for doing good works he's preparing in advance for us to do. And that will be focused on the way we treat other Christians. It means that we are going to walk the walk. We are going to act in a way that points to our Lord. We are going to talk the talk. Everything we say will reflect the one who saved us and participate in his work of building up his people. And we will be impressed by the Spirit, being formed by the shape of God's Spirit, just like a piece of wax is formed by the seal pressed into it. Thank you for listening to the recording of the Dublin Bible Talks. You can join us in real time on Wednesdays at 1pm Dublin time on Zoom, bit.ly slash Dublin Bible Talks. That's bit.ly slash Dublin Bible Talks.